Welcome to the virtual campfire. My name is Sydney Williams, author and founder of Hiking My Feelings, and I'm so glad that you're here. The virtual campfire started as a replacement for what we were missing on the trail during the pandemic in 2020. We wanted to be sharing stories and listening to music and having conversations about hard topics at the end of a long day, shared in some of the most beautiful places in the world. In the absence of that, the virtual campfire was born and 50 something episodes later, we're still here. And this season, we're doing things a little bit differently. Over the course of the next few episodes, we're going to be sharing stories from people who have been through our 12 week online program called Blaze Your Own Trail to Self Love. Now, if you've been watching the virtual campfire or listening to the podcast from the beginning, you'll know that this program was launched after our initial 20 episodes of the virtual campfire. This program took everything that we had planned to do on the road in 2020 on my book tour through the US and Canada, workshops, retreats, overnights, group hikes, all of those things, and put them into a 12 week program that was available online so we could stay connected during the pandemic. Now we are getting ready to start our fourth class of this program on August 21st, and we couldn't think of a better way to get people hyped up about it, bring awareness to what we're doing, and share the stories of how this program has impacted real human lives than to bring on some of the people that have been through the program themselves. So I hope you have a nice, comfortable seat. I hope you have a beverage of choice, maybe a cozy blanket, maybe a journal. You never know what you're gonna hear that you might wanna jot down. So have a seat, sit back, relax, unless you're driving, then <laughs> keep doing what you're doing. But we hope you enjoy the virtual campfire. Thank you so much for being here. party people i am here with kaleidoscope kid who i recently became aware of and as soon as i read your bio i felt like we are the same person and we've been on a very similar journey um except you make music and your healing happened in sedona so um to get things started how about you introduce yourself tell everybody who you are where you're from today and uh we'll go from there uh, my name is the Kaleidoscope Kid. Some people know me as Josh. And uh, uh, right now I'm uh, making the venture to Los Angeles, California. So just moved there. And uh, it's been really exciting. Just a, a lot of music opportunities coming up. And this year we're just trying to get uh, as many shows, tours and festivals and things like that. And just keep uh, traveling and keep uh, meeting new people. Heck yeah. And you had a... Uh album come out on in uh april tell me all about it what are you most excited about how's it been going that, uh, it's it's awesome the uh the album is is really cool it's kind of like uh first off the art the artwork on the album uh is uh, something that really uh, uh i feel like very fortunate to have uh it's an artist his name's mossy giant and he's from amsterdam he's done uh some incredible work he uh did like the uh uh, Amsterdam Cannabis Museum out there and did like, he, he has some pretty big accolades. So um, the fact that we were able to come together to make something that reflected the album was really awesome. And then um, it's, it's cool. There's some, there's some really interesting songs on there um, that are kind of a few years old. And then there's some songs on there that are, were written this year, last year. So it's kind of like a diverse uh, uh, spectrum of where I've been at musically and things like that. But uh, and then we have a feature on there. Uh, this, the album only has one feature with the uh, the friend Big B. And uh, so there's some really cool stuff on there for sure. Heck yeah. Um, well, let's let's throw it back a little bit. Um, before we started recording this, I read your bio for all the people. It was like story time. It was really nice. Um, so let's talk about your diagnosis and then your healing journey. Um, here at Hiking My Feelings, we're all about healing in nature. And it sounds like you took that straight to heart. I'd love to hear the story from, yeah. from your, from your perspective. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I was, I'm 29 now. I was 21 about to turn 22 and, uh, I had been living in Sedona for about a year. I kind of, I went out there, um, and started collecting spring water and just kind of, that was a huge draw, like to, to be there permanently. 
um, rather than driving two hours every week to go fill up water and stuff like that. So that was kind of what brought me out to Sedona initially. And then uh, I had some really uh, powerful experiences out there with, uh, with LSD and with uh, psilocybin. And it was like, yeah, I definitely want to be up here for a little bit and just follow this curiosity right now. And uh, so I had been in Sedona for about a year. Um, I woke up one morning and the best way I can describe it is if you've ever burned yourself, you get like a little like water blister kind of thing. And so I woke up and I went to brush my teeth and I felt this just really intense pain. And uh, I started spitting out blood. And so I was like, okay, what's going on? And I lifted up my gums and the entire inside of my gums had been lined with these, what looked like water blisters, but filled with blood. So it was like these black pockets going through all my mouth. And uh, I was like, oh, this is not good. Uh, like I have like oral cancer or something. That was my first thought, you know? And um, at that point, I, I don't know if it was denial or what it was, but I kind of just was like, I'm gonna wait this out. And, uh, I feel like for lack of a better words, I went to like the dog under like the dying dog hiding under the porch kind of mentality. And I just like went into my room, spent a lot of time outside and was just kind of just like sitting with it. And um, after about a week or two, the sores that were uh, specifically in my mouth started to appear on my eyes, in my, uh, in my ears. Uh, and then it started to become topical on top of my skin. So uh, it started getting really bad. And if you've ever burned yourself and got in like the shower, it stinks. So, so the fact that my mouth was lined with all of that, putting water and drinking water was extremely uncomfortable, uh, but it was bearable at the moment. And, and then eating food became less and less of an option over the days. Uh, there was really no way for me to put down any food. And so it had been like, I want to say like 10, 11 days. And, uh, my girlfriend at the time was like, yo, you're going to the hospital. Like you're, you're, this isn't okay. I'm not gonna let you die. Here. And we went to the hospital and, um, we drove down to Phoenix and went to the hospital on Phoenix. And when they checked me in, they were like, yo, we don't know what this is. Like we're going to, uh, they were talking about putting me in quarantine at first because they were really confused with what was going on. And they, uh, they ended up bringing in a bunch of infectious disease doctors and different doctors to just for the next, like, four days, uh, just running tests on me and doing all this stuff. And so they, thankfully I was able to get some, some water and some nutrients in me through the IVs and stuff like that. But it was really, when I got checked in, I weighed 93 pounds. So, and, and normally I was like at like 125. So I had really dropped a tremendous amount of weight in those two weeks. I'm just no, not eating at all. And, um, so by that point I was, it felt good to be, uh, like in the hospital, because I was like, all right, well, uh, at least we're, we're taking care of it. You know what I mean? But I was still uncertain of what was going to happen. And after like two or three days, the sores stopped getting worse and started to show signs that they were healing. It wasn't getting worse. It was starting to heal. And so they were giving me really antibiotics and, uh, to treat it at that point. And they had, uh, at that point, they, they gave me this symptomatic diagnosis um, because they couldn't, everything they were testing me for, it was, it wasn't showing up as positive. So what they found was that I, uh, it seemed like I had this, uh, autoimmune disease called Reiter's syndrome. And the way that they were like, yo, like, uh, it normally isn't like this. Like it affects the mucous membrane, uh, for sure. But it normally is specific to the palms of the hands and the bottom of the feet and certain things like that. So if it is Reiter's syndrome, this is just an extremely rare case of it. And they, and, and they were like, but the good thing is this will probably never happen again. Writer syndrome is kind of like that. And I was like, okay, cool. Uh, so after that, I, sweet, we're yeah, done. Was, Yay. Yeah, <laughs> and, uh, so after that, like my body was just destroyed. So I had a, a long recovery period for sure. Now that I had the antibiotics and, uh, the IVs and stuff, it was like, okay, I can, I can handle this. And the, before I could completely eat comfortably. Like, uh, like I get to a point like, uh, you know, like two or three weeks after getting out of the hospital where if I ate something, uh, I could start to eat things that were really like mashed potatoes or eggs or something like that. But if I tried, uh, something that was like as high in acidity or something, it would still just, just felt like 
insane going through my body. Um, so it took like a month of, of recovering before I was completely back to how I was before. And I always uh, say like in that month of recovery, there was so much uh, trauma going on and, and that I would just be so overwhelmed and I'd uh, pick up the guitar. And the thing was actually, I forgot to mention that um, I picked up playing the guitar probably about two months before this happened. So it was very new into my life, the guitar was. Um, and I was sick and I would pick up the guitar and I'd start playing and it would literally be like the walls would fall down. Like it was like, oh, I don't feel any pain, any, I was completely present uh, to the point where I would just like almost be in tears because it was like, wow, like I'm right here. And so, so that was really where I, I felt like the, the bond happened between me and, and, and the instrument and music as far as like its capacity to, to heal and uh, to be this meditative thing. And this just, it's medicine for sure. And, um, and then after that, it was probably about, a, a, you know, I'd finished recovering from that. I had a kind of uh, been writing a lot of music and I remember the whole time being like, just let me be able to sing again. Let me be able to talk and I will make music every day. Like I'll do it every day. Um, and so then it was probably like a month later, uh, it hit me again, the, uh, the flare up did. And so at that point I had, uh, I had gone to a rheumatologist and so I went back to her and I didn't have to go to the emergency room, but I needed to get antibiotics prescribed to me again. But I knew that um, my, my parents have met a lot of medical history when it comes to autoimmune conditions. And I knew that after the second round of antibiotics, they were going to start to try to up what was, uh, whether it was methotrexate uh, or certain things to try to suppress the immune system. And um, like my mom receives infusions of methotrexate. My dad takes shots and stuff like to, to suppress it his immune system from attacking himself. And so I was like, uh, I really don't want to go that route. I've kind of just seen them wake up and have to take a handful of pills every day for my life and things like that. And uh, it was right around April and I just got my tax returns back and I was like, all right, I'm going back to Sedona, got some money, like we'll figure it out. And uh, uh, that was really when I kind of just like, uh, it was like a trust fall with the universe. I was like, all right, uh, let's just see what happens. And so I started spacing out the antibiotics and I had like one or two flare ups over the next month or so, but the antibiotics were able to keep it, uh, keep it under control. And I was trying, like, I was really, uh, seeking all sorts of, uh, forms of healing, especially in Sedona. There's just so many, uh, different approaches that people would take than in Western medicine. And so there was a lot of, uh, access to those things out there. And as much as I was trying everything, nothing, was, nothing was working, nothing was working. And, uh, I, I had two, uh, pills left of my antibiotics and I was going through a flare up at the time. Uh, and my roommate came home and he brought up this guy, his name's Daniel Vitalis. And he has a podcast called rewild yourself. And he really goes into like, just some really uh, in-depth stuff, like when it comes to uh, Chinese medicine, uh, uh, his whole thing is kind of like rewild yourself and primal eating and things like that. And so he, he had a, got this DVD from him that had a bunch of elixirs on it. And so he was like, yo, there's so much information in here, but uh, pay attention to this one thing right here because I know you're going through an autoimmune uh, disorder. And so this, this seems like uh, in, in that lane. And so uh, when he showed it to me, it was uh, the reishi mushroom. And I'm not sure if you're familiar with it. Yeah, right. Yep. Mushroom. Love hey, me oh. some reishi mushrooms, man. Exactly. God, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. And so, so the way he described it was it was an autoimmune system re-educator. So whether your immune system was overactive or underactive, it knew how to get it back to a balanced state. And what uh, he suggested was adding in what they, what's known as camu camu berry. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so it's extremely high in vitamin C. And the reason for that is when vitamin C is uh, consumed with the fungus, it allows you to absorb the nutrients of the mushrooms like 10 times easier than you would be able to otherwise. So I started incorporating that with these two pills left that I had of antibiotics. I set those to the side and with, within three to five days, it was completely uh, uh, like back to normal. And I remember being like, just uh, so empowered 
And so yeah. like, I felt really, I was like, yo, okay. Like, because in my head, I, and it wasn't that it was going to take it away, the Reishi mushroom or anything. It was like, if I can get through these, these flare ups and not die, then my body, I believe will have a better understanding of how to approach it next time and keep re-educating it and re re-establishing that relationship with my immune system. And so, um, so then that led to, uh, really, uh, becoming like, uh, like the ratio mushroom and, and cam cam, it was what was getting me through the flare ups. I was still having flare ups every once in a while, but they would make it, I mean, the, uh, a hundred times better. Like, it now, was like were really you hard. taking, were you taking the reishi and camu camu only when you had flare ups or was that like a daily thing? And so at first I, I, I started to incorporate it daily and then I got a flare up again and it wasn't bad, but I realized that I needed to do it when I was having a flare up. So rather than doing it every day, I'll still incorporate, uh, like I'll have reishi mushroom in some of my drinks and things like that. But if I have a flare up is when I'm like, okay, we're going to blast the system and I'll, I'll incorporate, um, you know, like a lot of other things as well. Like I, I'm big on juicing. So like usually when I'm having a flare up, it's like I stick to juice and uh, just like hydrating my body and then vitamin D uh, as well, like seems to help, um, especially where I was in Sedona. I was in a canyon. So we only got like five or six hours of sunlight a day as the sun came and set. So it was really crucial to get some vitamin D in as well and things like that. But that, uh, so that was, you know, uh, a year into it and it's been five years since. And so I was using the reishi mushroom and the camu camu for the past few years. And then uh, it's probably been about two years now since I've had any flare ups at all, any symptoms at all. So that, exactly. Yeah. And uh, uh, along the, along the way, I've also, uh, really become fond of uh, Wim Hof and his breathing exercises and cold therapy and all the science behind that. Um, I actually, I had a, uh, a tooth pulled uh, not too long ago and I knew that my body was gonna have an immune response to it. And usually that's what would trigger the, the flare up to happen because it's like, oh, what's happening, attack the body. And so uh, I started to have a very uh, minimal uh, uh, side effects or, or a flare up come up, you know? And rather than doing the reishi mushroom and the camu camu, I saw it as an opportunity to see if the breathing exercise and the cold therapy could really do it. And I didn't even have to take the reishi and the camu. I was able to, to, to navigate that one just purely with the, the breathing exercises and the cold therapy. So at first I was bummed. I was like, dude, this, I can't believe I'm having a flare up again. And I was like, hold on, this is an opportunity for me to apply all these things that I've been learning and really see if they work. And so, uh, so I can say now it's been two years and, uh, like I haven't had any flares at all. And I'm very fortunate. Like, I know that's not how it is with everyone. My goodness. Yeah. <laughs> God, there's so much good stuff in here. First of all, like, so for listeners that aren't familiar with my story, uh, replace autoimmune with diabetes, replace, mm. uh, reishi and camu camu with just like plant-based and drinking as much water as humanly possible. Um, and same, right? Like I just, I, oh uh, Lord, I'm so excited <laughs> for you. Like, man, cause it sounds like when you were describing the, the first sores that you had inside your mouth, I was just like, how can you even function? Like that must've been absolutely horrifying. And my mom actually had oral cancer. She had part of her tongue removed and grafted um, when I was a senior in college or senior in high school. And I remember taking the gauze out of her mouth, like to help her just like pack the wound afterwards and the blood in the sink. Like when you said that, I was like, whoa, throw me yeah. back to when my mom had oral cancer. It was, I mean, it's intense and yeah. wow. I just, holy guacamole, like learn, <laughs> losing, weighing in at 93 pounds, I just, so, okay. I, wow. So this is, this is happening in Sedona. You're healing. First of all, I love Sedona. I love the vortexes. I love the hiking. I love the crystal stores. I love everything about Sedona. Um, so let's talk about, I love the phrase trust fall with the universe. Have you, now that you're on the other side of all of this, and it's been two years since you've had a flare up, what were you feeling before you did your trust fall with the universe? And how do you feel when you reflect back on that decision in that time? Um, I feel like there was, there was a lot of, uh, at that point in my life, I was, I was still dealing with like a lot of aggression and wasn't able, wasn't 
really sure how to navigate that and was was dealing with that and uh i actually uh i kind of i broke i like shattered my hand uh at one point kind of out of aggression and after that that really sat me down for a while because uh uh, and I'm not the type of person to go to the doctor and things like that. So I was just kind of dealing with it at that point. And that really softened me and opened my heart in a way that hadn't before. And, and it was like, um, you know, I'm really fond of people like Alan Watts and Ron Doss and things like that. And so it's like, uh, so like Alan Watts would always say, you know, you have to trust the universe as you would trust another. And there were so many experiences that were happening where it really felt like I could do that. Like I, like in the same way that I know he, Alan Watts brings it up where it's like uh, in the same way that God will clothe the, the fields with grass and the trees with leaves. So too shall he not, uh, you know, like give you everything you need. And so it was, uh, and, and really that kind of set me on course for a whole new uh, path. And really, I feel like gave me the foundation I needed to, to step into the music stuff, to do other things like that, and to just be able to, to know that as long as I have my compass pointed in the direction of love and in the direction of, of being, uh, you know, standing in my truths and these things that I was gonna have what I needed, even if it wasn't what I wanted, it was gonna be exactly what I needed, you know? Yes. Oh man. Okay, so timeline wise, during this like exploration with the Reishi and Camu Camu, is this also introducing hallucinogens into this or does that come later in your journey? The, the hallucinogens were before that. Uh, when okay. I was about like 17 or 18, I really started to get into that. And I just had certain experiences with them. I would just take them by myself and I would be like, okay, this is the most interesting thing I've ever experienced in my entire life. Like, I, and and um, my mom would always say, she's like, whatever you liked, you did it 150%, whether it was skateboarding or anything. She's like, so when you started doing drugs, it just makes sense that you do it 150%. Like, and so- I, Were you really good at doing drugs? <laughs> I was pretty good at it. I was pretty good at it. And um, so, so then, um, you know, uh, when I was younger, there was, it was all sorts of things. But when I got to Sedona is really when I stopped drinking alcohol uh, I stopped uh, doing a lot of things and it really, uh, uh, I, I, I was still using LSD occasionally, but, but psychedelic mushrooms were just giving me these in experiences, and these insights and this, uh, this opportunity to reflect on my experiences and to, to, it was, I mean, you, if you've ever done it, you know what the potential is. And so it's like, uh, <laughs> my husband and I call it my first, my, like my first psychedelic experience, the great rearranger, <laughs> <It's> like <laughs> yeah. it just complete, like it, it just hero dose knocked me out and <laughs> I came back a whole new person. Like it, I am such an enthusiast of that for a healing modality. I had no idea it was exactly what I needed. Like yeah. just absolutely uh, rearrangers. Like the Heath just mentioned that I was like, that is the best. <laughs> like all, all the good cells stayed, all the bad cells went like, I just, yeah. yeah big fan. Yeah, absolutely. And so psychedelics definitely played like a, they played a huge role. And I remember um, after I had the experience where I incorporated the reishi mushroom and, it, and the camu for the first time and it worked. I remember going outside and it was a full moon and I'm like yelling at the moon. I was like, what can mushrooms do? Cause they've, they've helped me so much emotionally. And now they're literally saving my life physically. It was like, oh my goodness. And uh, so, yeah, I, I mean, it, it really just, uh, and then that's when uh, Paul Stamets, I'm sure you're familiar with him. He makes, uh, he does, he makes these, uh, the mushroom blends and they sell them in stores and things like that. And so I started to get into a lot of his, uh, talks and discussions and, uh, he released that documentary, fantastic fungi, which I thought was, amazing. Oh my God. So good. That between yeah. that and intelligent trees, I was like, how do people not spend more time in the forest? And like, why are we not giving yeah. more funding to research around this? Like our friend, um, we have a buddy up in Oregon that has a mushroom farm. Um, and he was like, when we first learned about it, like they do like grow your own lion's mane kits at the farmer's market mm -hmm. and stuff like that. So he like taught us how to like make the block and then inoculate it with the spores and all this stuff. And he was talking about how like you can grow mushrooms on gasoline soaked jeans and it just eats it. And like from a waste management perspective, just like it actually blows my mind. And that fantastic fungi, when I was like, 
I'm just an evolved mushroom. I was like, what is happening? <laughs> like, this is, I like, how are we not talking about this more? Like at first I was like, this is some hippy dippy shit. But then like, I had the same experience. Like Chaga has been absolutely amazing for me. Yeah. And I like, oh my Lanta, I just, <laughs> I could go on and on. This is so much fun. So, yeah. okay. So you have this, uh, this healing experience. You're in Sedona. Um, talk to me about creating music and getting into all that. Yeah. Well, I was very fortunate. Uh, uh, when I got back to Sedona, uh, I spent like a, a little bit of time living in, uh, in like a trailer park out there for, for the first few months. And then I got this job opportunity, um, in between Sedona and Flagstaff, they have Oak Creek Canyon, which is just, you know, the middle of the woods right there. And so, uh, it's, I ended up working at this bed and breakfast, which is pretty much like the last place before you get to the middle of the woods. We had no uh, neighbors for like 10 miles in each direction. And it's 20 log cabins out in the middle of the woods uh, and the property that the guy who owned the property owned from rim to rim. So if I went to my backyard, it was just into the mountains. If I went to my front yard, it was the creek and into the mountains. Like there was no one around us, complete, you know, uh, uh, kind of isolation in that sense. And he really became like a father figure uh, as far as holding that space. He was extremely supportive and he uh, let me live there for free. He, uh, so I was making an hourly rate. I was making good money helping out on the property and I got to live there for free. And so that, like, I would leave that place maybe once or twice a month to go get groceries. And other than that, I was just hanging out at the cabin and just uh, working at the garden, walking around, hanging out, you know, having a lot of friends come, come by. And, uh, and uh, I wanted people to, to be able to experience what I was experiencing. So I, I always had like a very much an open door policy. I would come home and friends would just be at my house. and like, what's up guys, you know? And uh, so, so that really facilitated the space for me to be able to focus on music. Cause like if, when I, when I would be on, on, uh, on a shift, I would have to go, you know, help out, uh, maybe like a toilet was clogged in one of the cabins. And then I'd just take the golf cart back to my house and I had a little walkie talkie and I just work on music and then it'd be like, Hey, can you go do this over here? Cool. Hop in the golf cart. But I, I, I was just always able to focus on it. And, um, uh, especially, uh, you know, being up there, and being so isolated, it just gave me the freedom to really explore myself and not feel worried about anything. And looking back, uh, it's crazy because you just, you don't recognize it until you're out of it. And it's been like two years now. And I'm like, damn, I was really uh, doing a lot of crazy stuff. And, and, and uh, you know, it, it was, in the end, it definitely gave me the space to be able to make the music I'm making now. But, but after I got sick, and started singing like i said uh, i kept saying let me sing again and i'll sing every day and i felt like i had made a deal with god with the universe to be like all right i have to show up and i almost felt that if i didn't that's when i would start to have flare-ups again when i would start to pull back from that it was this very strange kind of like okay i see you i hear you like i'll show up yeah oh i love that <laughs> so much yes Oh my gosh. I just can't. Um, okay. So tell me about blue is blue still part of your life is blue still on this planet. Like what's the relationship like? What kind of dog is blue? Tell me everything. So, uh, blue is an Australian shepherd Rottweiler mix. So he's, he, yeah, he's kind of like a short haired Australian shepherd and he was the, he was the runt. So he wasn't like a super big dog, but he was just this very, uh, intelligent, very like, uh, like when I got him, uh, it was, my girlfriend and I at the time we were living in our truck, uh, just out in the woods. And so the first six months of his life, he never was on a leash. He was just wandering around the, the campsite and I'd be like, where is he? And I'd call and then he'd run back to the, you know, run back and be like, oh, there he is. And so he, he grew up with a lot of freedom and, and to do that. And then, um, uh, we, it was probably like two or three years later, uh, my girlfriend and I at the time, uh, decided to separate. And even when we got the dog, it was like, uh, yeah, like it was actually funny. It was because we were living in our truck at the time and she was like, can we get a dog? And I was like, if you get rid of half of your stuff, then you can have a dog. And she got the dog. And I was like, but if we ever decide if our paths take us somewhere else, like it is your dog, you know what I mean? Yeah. But as much as it was her dog, like it was my dog as well. And, and I spent so much time with him and really he was like a, a soundboard, like, uh, 
I, I would just talk to him like a person. Like, what do you think of that one? You know, what do you think of that song? And he would just look at me like, all right, cool. And uh, you know, I love I was, that part of your bio where it's like, <laughs> as long as Blue liked the song, I'm happy. Like, exactly. So yeah. good. <laughs> and so like, it, you know, he would, I'd, I'd be working on music and stuff and I'd look over and he'd be laying in front, laying in front of the speaker and things like that. And so he was, uh, uh, you know, it was easy to talk to him as, as opposed to some people. So, yeah. <laughs> Ain't that the truth? Um, well, let's do this. Let's let's pause our conversation. If do you have a song you want to share with us? Yeah, I would love to. Okay, cool, perfect. Well, then I will. Uh, I'll let you take it away. Tell us what it is, what it's about. Do your like like you're on stage. Tell us a story. <laughs> cool. All right. So this song, uh, this is some unreleased stuff. But in the midst of uh, moving to California and all these things that have been going on, uh, this was kind of the song's called "Bite the Bullet." And uh, it's kind of just stepping in front of whatever's coming at you and uh, being ready to take it on. So. I'm like, uh, so when are we going to jam around a campfire? I throw retreats in the wilderness and I'd like really like for you to come. <laughs> oh yeah. The way it looks over there, I'm trying to come to Maine. I've never been there before. Like, oh beautiful. dude, it is, it is, it is something up here. I, so I grew up in Kansas, uh, where winter is icy and sad and there's nothing fun to do about it. Um, and my husband's from New Hampshire. And so he's like, he's a rugged outdoorsy guy. He's been telling me about winter has the entire time we've been together. And then we got up here this is my first winter in new england and i was like oh i see <laughs> yeah you guys are tough i get it it is cold like there were nights where it was like minus 15 up here i was like this is this is next level get me back to san diego please and thank you <laughs> oh goodness um okay so like uh question if you had a magic wand and you could like wave it over society and doing that would educate the masses about something, eradicate something, um, make the world a better place in some way, get rid of the bad stuff. What would your magic wand do and how would that impact the world? Hmm, that is a really awesome question. Um, I feel like if I had a magic wand, I would, 
I feel like I, I would like it to touch everyone's heart enough to where they realize that they are completely perfect in their being, that the divinity of everything is around them. And just to be reminded that you are, you know, the universe expressing itself. It's like, you're not a drop of water in the ocean, you're the ocean in a drop kind of thing. And just to not to know it at the, at the thinking mind level, but to feel it at the heart level and to feel it in your being, you know, I feel like, because if you can feel that again, it, it just uh, reflects outwards. And I feel like you can't look at people the same. You don't, you, you see people as your brothers and sisters, you see the interconnectedness and things like that. 100%. Oh, I like that one. And yeah, I feel like, well, and I think like more and more, we have like a conscious understanding of that. We have the language for it, yep. but like, and I, and this is true for me on my healing journey. Like I'll pick up some phrasing that like ex- articulates a feeling I felt or an experience I've had. And I'm like, Ooh, okay. And then like, I tend to just kind of assume that I've got it. And just because I have the language doesn't mean that I have like a full body understanding. So I love that like brain level and also heart level. Cause yeah. once it sinks in, you're like, oh, I, I, I <laughs> okay. was, uh, I, I remember I was at a, a peyote ceremony with the, the native American church. And at the end, they asked us to say like four words that would, that summed up our experience. And for me, it was uh, transforming knowledge into wisdom. And I think that's like where it becomes the wisdom is when it becomes like you understand it. But I, I, can't, I can't remember who I was listening to, but it's also uh, some of this knowledge and some of these ideas, they're so heavy. They're really deep and heavy that you that it's almost like if you look at it like a bodybuilder or like a, a weightlifter, they, they can lift it up, but you can only hold it for so long. Like You can't carry that weight all day. So then you got to set it back down again. But it's like, it's like, yeah, it's a lot to retain that, especially in the world that we live in and things like that. And we know it and it makes sense. But then like, you know, I said, like when that becomes, when that knowledge transfers into wisdom somehow through experience, through media experience and through just life, then that's, uh, I feel like it's a very powerful thing. Mm-hmm. Is there, so uh, we started this show as a result of the pandemic because we were planning on hosting retreats all around the US and we were doing a big, we were planning on doing a big hike around um, Chicago. And when everything got canceled, my book tour got canceled, our retreat tour got canceled, everything just, you know, I wasn't the only one, but I felt like I was at the time. Um, So we started this show as a way to one, reconnect with our community, two, share some stories of like hope and healing and inspiration in the outdoors. Um, and the vibe is kind of like, if we were around a campfire, like what would we be talking about at the end of the day? So do you have any stories of like healing in nature, anything like super profound that you'd like to share with our, our community here? Um, I think, I think, uh, being in nature has taught me a lot about, um, there's so much things that are in it that are outside of the, the, our spectrum of words, you know, but I think, um, one of the biggest things for me was being around water. Um, and really like we would, uh, I don't know who, who talks about it, but it's like, we, we, we tend to look at the mountains or something and we see these giant structures and we're like, look how strong it is and look how, uh, you know, like just how much power is in there. But then when you look about what carved the mountains, it was the, the water and that, that not being rigid was able to tear right through that. No problem at all, you know? And, um, so I think, uh, and then recently being out in California, kind of being in the ocean, it was it it put it even into more perspective because I, at first I looked at water as it like kind of being gentle and being like, uh, but I realized that when I was in the ocean, there was nothing about that that was gentle, but it, what it was was it wasn't rigid, and so uh, as and and I had kind of like a really uh, internalized the idea of being gentle and being compassionate, and the, and the ocean made me realize that I could also crash like a wave. I could be powerful as well. And I could be all of that. I could be strong. I could be calm, stand in my truth. I could do this, um, but to try not to be rigid. So I think uh, a lot of what nature has taught me, uh, and it's something that like one of my favorite things to do is look for caves. And I would find crazy caves out in Sedona, like really wild stuff. Uh, some stuff that I'm sure like not a lot of people know. And I would just go to these caves and I would just uh, sit in the darkness and uh, maybe I'd play like a sound bowl or sing or play some music and things like that. But I think uh, water and uh, the silence, that great silence is just uh, uh, like, even I know it exists. And I, I went on a hike a few days ago and I've been so busy the past few months 
And I was like, whoa, like it's so intense. Like it's crazy. Yeah. And that's, I'm actually really looking forward to getting back to California. Cause like there, obviously you can recreate in the snow, but like, we don't have the proper equipment. And I certainly didn't bring the, like, I don't have the right clothes. I live in San Diego for crying out loud. Like I don't have, <laughs> I don't have Arctic expedition gear. Um, but I'm, that's one of the things I'm most looking forward to about getting back to California is just like getting back to my favorite mountain and my favorite trail and my favorite place. Um, do you have a specific place that just like, have you ever, actually, I have two questions. First, do you have like a favorite place in nature that if you could return to like today, you would go right now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's this place, they call it Shaman's Cave out in Sedona. Uh, it's kind of a little bit outside of Sedona, but it's, it, every time I've been there, it's been uh, just extremely uh, magical experiences. Like beyond, like I'm like, all right, what is this? How is this even happen? Okay. <laughs> oh, I like that. Um, okay. So we know where you would go. Is there, have you ever had an experience where you're visiting somewhere for the first time, but you feel profoundly connected to the place? Yeah, absolutely. I feel like, uh, like, I feel like I always, uh, I think it was Ram Dass who said like, we're like, if you don't feel at home on earth, like you're doing it wrong kind of thing. And so like, try to find the home in every situation you're at. And so there's something about that. Like if I go to California it may seem chaotic and, and high energy and things. And then I go to nature out there and I feel like I'm in Sedona or I feel like it, it all carries over the same. Like, it's like, a, it feels like a, a mother holding in your arms. You know what I mean? Like, and you're just like, you're being embraced by it. And uh, it's just like, okay. when you can just feel your shoulders relax and your jaw relax and all that. So I think that is really where the parallel comes across. It's like that motherly energy and just, uh, yeah. And then, um, so I recently did a podcast interview with a different podcast host, like I was being interviewed. And one of the things that we were talking about was equating the outer wilderness, like nature and the world and everything that's going on with our inner wilderness. Mm -hmm. Do you have any parallels between locations that you've visited and how those, like how your inner wilderness is kind of mimicked or translated by the outer environment? Yeah, uh, I mean, the first thing that comes to mind is we, my friends and I would always joke that if you, if you looked uh, like where a person was raised at their environment, they were kind of like a reflection of the plants and stuff. So being from Arizona, everybody's like cactus. They're, they're very kind of like stern and they're a little spiky, but they're, they can, they, you can go a, a while without water. You know what I mean? <laughs> like there's certain things. So I've always felt like a, like a, a little desert rat or a cactus or like a, you know, like a snake or something like that. I feel like that kind of uh, definitely set me up for who I am today. I am obsessed with that. And case in point, super true. I was born in Kansas. I'm a sunflower. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. I really like that. Cause like, for, so for me, how that manifests in, um, in the way that we, host our events. Like we have a partnership with the Joshua tree national park association. And when we host events in Joshua tree, and when I go there, like for my own healing and for my own adventures, Joshua tree is just so expansive, right? Like there's not a, there's not a tree canopy. There's nothing like that. It's just like this big open vast sky. And that's where I get my best ideas. Like I can think in like leaps and bounds, bigger ways than I can if I'm not there. And then when I'm think when I think about like hiking, my feelings, like the actual act of using hiking to process complex emotions and, and like revisit trauma and heal from that, give me a tree canopy in the Sierra mountains. Like I just feel so held and protected and loved. And like, to your point, like that motherly, like embrace yep. by the trees, like that's where I go. And I'm like, safe to just let it rip and let the waterfalls fall from my face. <laughs> um, so I, I, but I love that about the plants. I had never really thought about that. And in our travels around the country, that is a hundred percent true. Like we've, <laughs> we've done two laps around the U S now, um, for hiking my feelings and people in like Colorado, very much different than Utah desert people. And that, mm. wow. Like I, I'm going to have to go hike on that. And like, just really soak that up because that is so freaking true. Oh my goodness. I love it. Okay. So is there anything that I haven't asked you about or any stories that you want to share or anything else that you want, um, the world to know about you or your music or 
any of your experiences that you've had on this planet in this lifetime in this body? Um, I mean, I'm very grateful to be here. I think we got into a lot of it. If anything, uh, go listen to the new album, The Kaleidoscope Kid. Uh, a lot of those songs were wrote in that cabin in the woods. So um, it's kind of like the, uh, the epitome of what was what I was going through and some of the, the ways I was processing it at the time. So nice. All right. So are there play, like, can we can people come see you play live? Like, what's your what's your show situation like? Yeah, this uh, uh, it's really been interesting because up until two years ago, I was just in a cabin in the woods and then uh, things have started picking up in the last year. And really this year, that's the main goal. And we have a good team behind us that are kind of making that happen. So the, it, the plan for this year is to be on the road the majority of the year. Nice. Uh, so, so that's what we're aiming for. We have so much music that we're, that we're locked in and that we have, that we're sitting on that uh, the, the most important thing right now is just keep touring, keep getting the music out there. And uh, yeah. Awesome. So if people are looking for you, where can they find you? Um, Instagram at the kaleidoscope kid is probably my, it, the best way to get a hold of me. I'm on Facebook, I'm on TikTok and Twitter and all that stuff as well. But I kind of just use that to post and then leave it. I, I'm not the best at social media stuff. So, but Instagram, I like, I can get down with it and uh, I can, I understand how to operate. So Instagram is the best place if you ever have, want to get with me. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us. And I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. And uh, as soon as we stop recording, we're going to start planning because we have to collaborate on something epic. So Absolutely, yes, <laughs> make sure you check out the Kaleidoscope Kid. Thank you so much for joining us. And let's, uh, let's go make some magic in the woods. Let's do it. Okay. If you're curious about how to make your next hike a bit more mindful, visit hikingmyfeelings.org slash subscribe to download our free trail thoughts worksheets.